Live Coffee Talk Show. I am Michelle Quay. I am a confidence coach and I work with negative self-talkers. Today, I, I am super excited because this is something that I can relate. Something I woke up this morning and I can completely relate to this. I have Michael O'Brien here with me. Michael O'Brien is the chief shift officer at Peloton Executive Coaching and who helps leaders prevent bad moments from turning into a bad day. I can relate to that. He has shared his personal transformational last bad day story and leadership advice on the tech, tech X stage with Fortune 500 companies, entrepreneur, fast company, real simple, ABC and NBC. So please join me and welcome Michael O'Brien because today if you're having a bad moment, this show <laughs> is for you. Good hey morning. Michelle, how you doing? Yeah, I'm thanks excited. for having me on. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, no, I'm so glad we were able to connect with our words. Just talking about Jim before we went live. Jim Naren, great guy, connected us, and just love the fact that we're both part of, part of the IPEC community, but just love what you're doing, love your message, and totally honored to be with you today. So Thank it's going to be great. Thank you so much. So, Michael, right now, this is COVID-19. It's, it's causing a lot of stress. It's a lot of you know, things and, and chaos and, uh, you know, re-shifting. I love the word that you use for your company, shift. There's a lot of shifting around, and which, you know, I, I mentioned bad moment, and I have a, a lot of those bad moments. So tell us about the bad moment. How did you get into the bad moment coaching? Well, so I had one big old bad moment. So in, in the, here in about, well, six weeks, I'll celebrate 19 years since that bad moment. So it was the day, some people know this story, but, that, but for those that don't, I was at a company meeting in New Mexico and I brought my bike out to get some exercise and I got hit head on by a speeding SUV, crossed so fully into my lane, going about 40 miles an hour based on what the police estimate. And hit me head on. I had nowhere to go. It went into his front grill, into the windshield, heard, still remember the screech of his brakes. And there I was, knocked unconscious, as one would imagine. I regained consciousness once the EMTs arrived, and I was surrounded by a whole bunch of a whole bunch. And I was in a whole bunch of pain. Mm -hmm. I knew my life was sort of in the in, questionable, in the balance, if you will. And I asked the question that only another cyclist can truly appreciate. I asked the EMT, it's like, oh, how's my bike? You know, like it was my, um, my way of sort of like reducing the tension of the moment. Cause I knew like, I knew how they were showing up that uh, there was a chance I was going to lose my life. And I just, I was sort of just was lying there thinking like, this is not how the story was written. This is not my script. This is now how it's supposed to end. And I remember just willing myself to stay awake. I thought if I stayed awake and held up my consciousness, I could control the situation, which is just crazy. But when they put me on the helicopter to take me to Albuquerque, I made a commitment to myself that if I live, life will be different. I'll stop chasing happiness. Cause I was, I was like one of those guys that I think current day, there's a whole bunch of those guys and gals who are chasing happiness. They want to be, they'll be happy when fill in the blank, get promoted, kids go to the right college, buy that new car, those external merit badges that we believe generate our worthiness. And I was doing that and that was stressful and I was packing all my stress inside. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my big bad moment. And then how I shifted it is that one mentor told me that, hey, Michael, this is when I was in a very low moment, moment in the early phases of my recovery. He was like, hey, all your events in your life are neutral until you label them. You get to choose your label. You're labeling yourself right now as a victim. You don't have to label yourself that way. You can label yourself in a completely different way. You can be defined by how you respond to this event as opposed to by what you're doing right now. And so that was the beginning of a little bit of an aha to help me move past this bad moment. And so it didn't get any more fuel than it deserved. Mm -hmm. As you're describing the incident, I, I 
my I, I'm having goosebumps because I can totally and this is the reason why Jim connected us because there's such a great similarity between our story and as you're describing that moment where the car is squeaking the tire is coming and you can smell actually smell the rubber and that is real it like I'm having goosebumps right now so I'm wondering, yeah. and thank you so much for sharing because I, I, I can totally relate that painful painful moment and you're waking up, you're kind of just lost and you're grasping to whatever that you can hold on to in that moment, just make things real. So I'm really curious, how old were you when this happened? I was 33 and my daughters were three and a half years old and seven months old. And my wife and I, Lynn and I had been married seven years at the time. so. If uh, social media was a thing back then, if we could stalk each other, Michelle, back then on Facebook or LinkedIn, it would have looked like I had like, hey, pretty good life. Two daughters, good marriage, um, pretty good job. Like I was a little bit of a big fish in a s small pond. I was the head marketing director for the company's flagship drug. So things were looking pretty good. But what people didn't see was how much I was pouring in trying to repress inside mm -hmm. and I wanted to keep that from view I had my version of my body armor on a lot of us walk around with masks uh, we're walking around with masks today of course for health reasons but before this we were walking around in masks all the time and uh, having our body armor on and just keeping all this that makes us who we are from view um, I didn't know how to repress stress. I just thought, well, that's just a normal part of life. That's why they pay you to do your job. It's stressful. I just didn't have any coping mechanisms to be able to release it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see because for a long time I was looking at the social media. So I, I'm in the era where social media has already been there. I'm a little younger <laughs> than my yes. girls. <laughs> and so my era has to do with all these pretty women, pretty girls, you know, you see them, you watch them, you're thinking, wow, these people, they must be really happy. And I know for a fact that that's not entirely true, but then I chose to see it as they must have a pretty good life. They're not, they're not, they're happy. They must have like a significant other, they have boyfriend, you know, who love them, who can love them back. And I was trying to make up to that image of how that looked like. And so I, like you said, you know, hiding those bad moments and hiding those experiences and just creating, creating that camouflage of, I look happy. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and which is shared by a lot of people. They, they have that camouflage in front of them or that, that they're dressing up every day and they're hiding away their emotions. So, what are some of the things that you have noticed from the clients that you're working with? Um, what, what, do they, what are they experiencing? What, what's the life like? Yeah, well today, as you mentioned in the opening, it's a whole bunch of, a whole bunch as far as emotions. And I, the way I, the analogy I've used to stay with like endurance sports is that like, because a lot of times in business, we're like, you know, business in life, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. I'm like, God, this, this COVID thing is not a marathon, it's a triathlon. It's longer and it's going to come in phases. And I think with a lot of the people I work with and just, just people in general, I think we went through that initial phase of, we'll call it chaos. That's how I've labeled it. Just like pure adrenaline. Like we're going, like we like, we were working at, you know, at a company and now we're working from home. And everything was sort of in this reactive mode. And we what, what you felt, because you know this, like our, how our thoughts drive our emotions, our emotions drive our behavior, our actions, that there was a lot of anxiety and worry and fear in this initial phase. But it was all adrenaline, like, whew, like shot out of a cannon, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would say about two weeks ago, I noticed like that initial chaos phase was starting to end. The adrenaline was wearing off and people were like, Huh, feeling tired, especially when we flipped into, you know, mid-May. I think people were like, well, maybe this is going to be over. We'll open up the economy. And some of that anxiety, worry, and fear started to turn to like frustration and anger in some circles. And now we have a little bit of tension in our culture. Like, should we open? How do we open? Should we stay shelter in place? And now we're sort of like 
not not really listening to connect with each other. We're just listening to reply and we're going back and forth. So I think there's a lot of that. There's a lot of like, wow, this dance with uncertainty is going to last a lot longer. So the one thing about a triathlon, you know when it's going to end. It's only a certain length. With this, we don't know. And that uncertainty is stressful for folks. So I think we're all carrying around our own backpacks. We just have a few more rocks in them. So we're a little bit more tired than usual just because that adrenaline has worn off. And now we realize from an energy perspective, we got a longer road to, say, pedal down. And I think people are like, well, how are we going to do this? And some people see it as a great opportunity because disruption, you know, is great, great time to be opportunistic. And other people, I think, still have a lot of worry. Like, what's, what's this new normal going to look like? Or are we using this moment to really create the type of change that we want to see in the world? Or are we just going to go back to the old version of how we were doing it? Because what makes people scared about that is that that wasn't working well enough for enough people. So, so then for those, because uh, those, a lot of clients that I spoke to, they're, they're in that moment where they don't know what to do. They're, they lost their job. They lost their motivation. And I know a number of them, they actually don't have a reason to get up in the morning anymore because that getting up in the morning means, what does it mean? It goes, it means that going from my bedroom to my living room. So what motivation do I need to do that? So a lot of them are not actually doing that. So how do we cope and how do we, how do we pull ourselves through so that we actually continue to do the things that matter to us, if there's any? Yeah, no, I think there are, there are definitely things we can do. I, Cause I went through that moment too. Like when, when they came out of the ICU and the doctor started telling me about like what happened to me and how badly I was injured, mm -hmm. the, the world that they painted was pretty grim. They were like, you're, you're like who I was, even though I was stressed out and doing the hamster wheel and all that jack. Like, they're like, that's over. And I was like, well, if I can't be who, who I was, who will I become? Because the, the picture they painted in the future was a lot of uncertainty. Like, yeah, we don't, like, we think you're, you're going to have health issues going forward, dependency, more pain and suffering, more surgeries, probably going to not be able to walk very well, cycling's out of the question. And it, so I got really dark really quickly. And I lost, you know, I sort of lost my why, if you will. I was like, well, what? who am I? You know, and I think for a lot of people, we put a lot of our identity in our job. So when we lose our job during a situation like this, we're like, well, who am I? Well, for me to really start making this more of the shift to say, okay, we can have bad moments. Hey, I've had plenty of bad moments since my last bad day. I just don't want to give them any more energy or fuel than they deserve. So to be able to like sort of surf the waves, if you will. Mm -hmm is understanding our why. So for me, it was like, I had to get out, out of that hospital bed into rehab, not for me, but for those around me, those who came to my aid, namely starting with my wife and my daughters. Like I wanted to be there for them. And so I think when we get stuck in moments like this, it's, it's important to really sort of understand like who, who is out there beyond us, like have a, a why that's bigger than us. So the classic like we over me. And I think this moment in time, we have a big, we, hey, this is about our culture moment in terms of showing up the right way um, because I can be fine, but not even know it. So like, I think there's, there's ways to find our, our bigger purpose, our bigger why. The first step is like looking beyond ourselves to those around us who need us to show up in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree because I think, I do believe that, you know, if you're in, in your situation too much, you know, it's good idea to kind of have broadened your view in, in terms of changing that shifting that me to a we perspective. Um, I do want to make a disclaimer, though, if you're someone who ha who's, you know, have a history of seeing yourself and having that depression, sometimes those moments you actually need to seek help, you actually need to seek um therapy. Absolutely. What we're talking about here is more for someone, you know, suddenly you're finding yourself in a situation, your life changes, and you're stuck in the moment, but you're not, you know, habitually this way. And, and this is the case that we're talking about, not the, um, the, the pattern way of you're in depressed, you're, you're suffering from anxiety. Those, the proper channel would be to seek a therapy. So I, 
Yeah, I completely yeah. agree with that, Michelle. There's difference between, like, you know, for folks that need, like, May is National Mental Health Awareness Month. And so I think it's, if you know, it falls, you know, the timing, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe not. But, like, as we go through COVID, I certainly... You know, there's a lot going on, a lot that we're dealing with, and we're we're feeling a lot in some in some ways not comfortable talking about it. So the fact that we are in, you know, National Mental Health Awareness Month, I think it's particularly important so we can start talking about what we're feeling and when we need to seek the counsel of a professional therapist to help us get through these moments. So what you what you just shared, spot on, um, totally agree. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's values behind the therapy. And, and I think part of it has to do with ourselves, you know, not feeling ashamed about what we're experiencing. And we don't openly share. We're not vulnerable to each other, even to the closest, uh, our closest family. And we don't, we don't openly just share, hey, you know, honey, I'm feeling a little, little depressed and this is what I'm going through right now. What can you do to support me? We don't do that. Is, is that how you experience it during your your moment of shift, your aha? Yeah, I would say that, like, I didn't really have the vocabulary or, and really none of the role models to say, especially as a man, like, you know, as boys, we're given the script to be tough and strong and confident. And we, we push our emotions down. We're, we only allow certain emotions like anger and frustration to reveal themselves. You know, those are, in some circles, those are masculine emotions to express. So I didn't necessarily know in the beginning how to ask for help. I thought asking for help was a sign of weakness as opposed to an invitation to get closer to one another. I've learned that over my recovery. It's, it's, you know, it's a lot easier than I realized, you know, and it does bring us beautiful connections. So, um, you know, for me though, it's, it's, you know, asking for support and help in this moment in time is so vital. And also trying to like destigmatize mental health concerns. You know, we openly talk about when we have like a sprained ankle or, you know, a torn ACL in our knee or a cardiovascular issue. We talk openly about that to others or heck even, even the flu, right? Um, so those are just illnesses, right? Of, that impact the body a little bit differently than a mental health concern. So I, I would love for us to get to a point where we can speak as openly about a, say, a brain injury or, you know, something like not functioning as well in the brain as we do our knee not ne necessarily functioning as well. So how do we make mental health um, as important as cardiovascular health, as important as orthopedic health? We have a long way to go, but hopefully over time, maybe this moment in time can be a good accelerator that we can get there mm -hmm. because so many people are dealing with so much, we need to be able to feel what we need to feel. So, you know, we can handle what we need to handle in this moment. I think what, what, what comes up for me is what your mentor coach had, had say, you know, don't put labels on these things. And one of the words that I love to use, and my colleague actually used it on me, he said, you don't have a disability, you have a condition. This is your condition. <laughs> so outside of your condition, you're perfectly fine. You're perfectly capable. You can park on the, on the top of the roof of a parking structure and walk down because you're talking about equality here. So that mean, let me give you equality. This condition that you have does not live near you. So that's a great word that I have learned to just, you know, it's a condition. It, anybody can overcome yeah. condition. Whereas illness yeah. feels more tight more constrained a disability feels more constrained you know not being able to walk feels more constrained it's just a condition that we can work through yeah i love that you know i love that and i i had to like in my own way sort of deal with that like it, it, my gratitude practice which i had like i didn't even know how to spell gratitude before my accident but i found gratitude as a way to like reframe what was happening to me I, like, early on michelle i was like I, I only focused on what I didn't have and couldn't do anymore, you know, or sort of in the spirit that we go where our eyes go. So if you see, um, if you see a lot of limitations in your life, you're probably going to see even more, right? If you see um, fear or hatred in your life, you're probably going to like go after even more. Um, so gratitude helped me redefine or reframe 
my days to say, okay, certainly there's things that I lost, some of it permanently, some of it temporarily, but there was so much I still had. There was so much I still could do. And so gratitude, even to this day, helps me like look at life differently. So I can point my eyes in a different direction. And that, that's been vital. And I think in this moment in time, as we all go through Corona, is do we, you know, question to ask is, do we have a gratitude practice? And if you don't, is it time to start one? Because there's so much you can look at to say, okay, we've lost a whole bunch. But I also think that we've gained, we've gained a whole bunch in this moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of it's not we haven't materialized it per se, we haven't lived it yet, but it's there for us that this moment is happening for us, not to us, to create something a little bit better tomorrow than it is today. And, but that's a choice that we have to make. But gratitude I think is, can be a great thing to practice, especially in this moment in time. Mm-hmm. I, I love what you share about gratitude. And, and you know, I, I do a gratitude journal as well. And every Friday, you know, I post, oh, cool. bring everyone's uh, gratitude together. And it's called, I call it gratitude Friday. So everyone shares something that they're grateful for. And I ask questions about it. But, you know, personally, what's interesting is that you brought up the gratitude. And I remember, you know, one of my friends was sharing this techniques with me. And he said, um, if you were to open up a bag of mosquitoes, and you pour it out in your hand. Look at what you have in your hand. Look at all the color that you have in your hand. That's, that's you, that's what you have. Look at it, appreciate it. So my mind was going through and my mind was thinking all the colors that I don't have. I didn't have the black one. I didn't have, I don't, I don't think a mosquito has purple one either. So I don't have all these other colors. So I was focusing on all the other things that I didn't have when I did the gratitude um, practice. So gratitude for me didn't really work. What would, be, what would be another way, you know, in addition to the gratitude that had really helped you? Because gratitude, I need to believe what I have and, and really truly believing and trusting it. Well, I think one of the big things for me coming out of, that was during my recovery, and I, I I didn't know where this really came from, mm-hmm. but I, I knew that as I sort of sat in my hospital bed and I wasn't making the type of progress I wanted to make, you know, coming, you know, a type of personality, go, 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 go faster, faster, faster. I wasn't making the right type of progress or fast enough in my, my humble opinion. Mm-hmm. But I knew this going, maybe dating back to my sports when I was younger, that mindset was so important. And I knew that moment in in that moment in time that I had to get my mind right in order to get my body healthy. That, you know, the whole concept of if we can worry ourselves sick, which we do, we do a a whole bunch of worrying ourselves sick in in today's culture, then maybe we can think ourselves well. And so a lot of folks would know like uh, Joe Dispenza, uh, depends, uh, I think I just botched his name, but um, I, so I've watched his videos and stuff being, um, so sorry, Joe. I've just <laughs> ruined your last name, but um, but I but I love I love his message. And you know, for me back then, it was like you know similar a, a similar type of thing where I knew I had to get quiet in order for me to get better. So for you know, I I didn't know anything about mindfulness. I didn't know anything about meditation really. I thought meditation. No offense, Michelle, was something that Californians did. Like it was all crunchy granola and woo woo. And I'm like, like we we. Yeah, on the east coast we don't do that like california hippie chick stuff like and that's not happening um those statements are of course are filled with judgment but that was back then this is now and i've uh, i'm more enlightened now i think um but i but i realized that okay i'm just going to start connect with my breath and get quiet as i start my day and really set my intention so i think in these moments it's good to like reconnect with your breath um, I, so I developed something called grabbing a PBR, which does not stand for a Pops Blue Ribbon, stands for pause, breathe, and reflect. And I recommend it to all my clients. It's just as simple as like hit the pause button. It's like nice inhale, hold, exhale for one to two minutes, and just reflect on what you want to do and say next as a way to slow things down. I think we more so in 2020 than in 2001 and during my accident, we are so busy. And 
we're not mindful in our busyness. We're not as purposeful as we could be. To slow down, think a little bit before we go forward, we'll get more stuff done and we'll have better quality and we'll have better connections because of it. I love it. I love it. Um, so what, say, like you, you know, what worked for me was actually Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I started to reading it. <laughs> yeah, we got to we gotta share both They're of them. Right here. I, 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 yeah. yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, yeah give him the yeah, props. So he, he, he can send his royalty payment to us. Yeah. <laughs> yes, send your loyalty payment to us. Um, so it helped me to stay mindful and, and just to take a pause, like you said, and, and start noticing my breathing and just even how I breathe, how I walk, that helped me quiet my mind. So, Michael, tell us where you are now. Are you riding a bike? Are you, what, what, were you able to get back on the bike? Yeah, so um, I got back on the bike 13 months after my accident. That was sort of like, the, the memoir that I came out with in 19, 1997, 2017. So uh, coming up to the three year anniversary of becoming an author. So I write about the journey from that last bad day moment to getting back on the bike again. And so, so I got back on the bike, you know, baby steps or baby pedals, small pedal strokes. Um, and now, but I'm still riding and come, um, come this July 11th. So every July 11th, I like to do big things to celebrate life and also to give back because, you know, I'm only here because other people helped us during our crisis. And I want to sort of give back to people in this, during this crisis. So I'm going to ride my bike 19 hours inside because of safety and stuff for 19 charities doing amazing work for those challenged with COVID. And the goal is to raise $1.9 million. So which um, that number makes my back sweat a little bit, but um, <laughs> I, I'm confident we can get there uh, with like the collection of all the different numbers, all the different charities. And a lot of people said like, well, that's crazy. 19 hours inside, that's crazy. Like I can't, you can never do that. And, I, and my response to them is like, you know what's crazy? What's crazy is like what we're going through. Like what's crazy is the fact that we have inequities in our society that we don't want to address. Like what's crazy is like what, sacrifices that our, our, our healthcare professionals on the front line are doing, or people working in our grocery store that we seem to blow past in the, in the past. We don't recognize, we don't see them, we don't hear them. Like all that is so much crazier than riding your, my bike inside for 19 hours. And if we could come together, and it's a, basically a virtual charity ride, uh, so other people can join me virtually and raise money for a good cause and put a little bit of like awesome sauce in their day on July 11th. So yeah, I'm still riding. We're not really racing this year because everything's been closed down, but I've, you know, I feel like I haven't had a bad day since that that day and I haven't had a bad bike ride since that day. So I've really tried hard to appreciate the gift of life and the fact that I get to live it every day and do something with it. And, you know, my purpose is to try to help people take advantage of the gift that they've been given and um, not, you know, yes, understand we're going to have bad moments. We're going to have sad moments and angry moments and all that, but I don't want a bad moment say on 2 PM on a Tuesday to ruin the whole week or a bad commute to ruin your whole morning. Like those are moments in time. They don't deserve any more fuel than they deserve. And let's try to move past that onto where we're really good so we can help shape more things in a, in a positive way. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> I could, I, I'm like so inspired and having goosebumps. And I think it's so important to start, stop hiding what's really uncomfortable for you and start living. And I think the key word here is living, you know, what happened in the past, you know, yes, it's very uncomfortable. We can't change anything, but here we are. How do you start living? How do you not let that bad moment turn into that bad day? And look at you, okay. you're biting your bike, you're doing the charity. And so how, first of all, two questions. What is the name of your memoir that was published in 2017? Oh, it's, uh, so I, it's called Shift. I'm not sure if that's backwards on the screen, but shift creating better tomorrows. 
So, um, and the cool thing, all the proceeds are um, donated to the charity World Bicycle Relief. They help girls conquer the challenge of distance by giving them a bicycle. So um, when I wrote the book, people are like, oh, you gotta write a book. You, become, you, know, you left corporate America to become a coach and a speaker. You gotta, like, you gotta write a book. It's gonna be good for your business. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that. It didn't, I didn't, for whatever reason, it didn't feel right. You know, your memoir, right, is like, it's like the naked you. Like, it's a little, it's a little scary. And I was like, you know what? This, my story is not about, like, the book's not about making money. It's about the message about what's possible with the right mindset, the right Peloton, the right community, as I like to say, and resilience and a whole bunch of other qualities. And so I decided to give the money away to a charity. So, um, so every book that's sold, that's bought, um, they get closer to a bicycle and those girls have more independence and economic vitality and it, it changes their life, you know, in, in far away places like Kenya and Zaire and Malawi. And, um, and I believe that we, you know, you know this too, one of the principles of IPAC, you change a life anywhere, you change lives everywhere. And um, that's what the book's all about. So. Love it. Where can people buy it? Uh, Amazon. You know, Jeff Bezos is always open for business, even during COVID. Um, or they can get an autograph copy uh, from uh, from my website, which is uh, michaelobrienshift.com. So you get a special autograph copy. Jeff Bezos can't autograph it, so uh, but I can. So. And then my last question would be, how far are you from that 19 nonprofit organization? Well, I need about five other ones. So I got 14 on board. I got five, I would say five to go. You never know what type of email we've been getting as we've been chatting here. Hopefully a couple have come in. We've had a little hiccup just because of the Memorial Day holiday, but um, yeah, five to go. Um, then we'll get 19 and then starting in June, we'll start publicizing it more and asking for donations and letting people know how they can sign up for the ride to ride virtually um, all together and, and put, put some effort behind some really great causes. So totally excited about it. Um, I'm excited for you. <laughs> nervous and excited. Yeah, I'm just, I, I'm feeling a lot of it. Like, you know, like, oh, what did I do to, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, like, uh, like all that. So it's all, all good. Like it's um, a great causes um, and it'll be fun that day. I think the day after on July 12th, I'm going to sleep in and not ride my bike. So. I'm, I'm celebrating for you. I'm going to get you a okay cake the, the day after and that we can celebrate it virtually. I'm going to sing you a song. And, All right. <laughs> and also in the meantime, I do have friends and you know, people who follow me, if you're a nonprofit organization and if you like to contribute to a good cause, reach out to Michael. You can find Michael at where? Michael. MichaelO'BrienShift.com. And then you can also like on Facebook, on LinkedIn, Instagram, all those different places. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming, Michael. It's been a pleasure to have you here on the show. It's great things that you're doing. And I'm really glad that you made that shift. Uh, well, thank you, Michelle. And like, I just want to get, shout out to you. You're doing amazing work and such an inspiration. So I would say keep up the great effort, the energy you put forth. You know, it's just not me, but I know everyone who follows you gets inspired by how you're showing up. And we need more, we need more Michelle's in the world. So uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, there's only one Michelle and she is extraordinary. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you everybody for watching and joining me today live. Uh, join me again next week on Wednesday at eight o'clock Pacific time at live coffee talk show where I bring you love, courage and connection. And I will see you next time. Bye everyone. Bye.